is the Lord. What's going on here? There's so much tension. It's like he's talking here, like I'm a vessel of love and all that stuff. <laughs> Weird. This morning on the way on the radio, what happened before, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. That makes what I watched even that much weirder. <laughs> yeah. I guess yeah. it's the over love. You want to smoke cute Chris Rock in the face. I missed the whole thing. And I, I, by the time my husband and daughter came in, I was sleeping on the couch, went upstairs to bed, looked at my phone. The family group chat, my son had posted two things from Twitter. That gave me a full. Oh no way! That <laughs> didn't look scripted. The entire thing. <laughs> I think that yeah. No, but initially when he was going off stage, when he made the joke, he was laughing. Was you saw laughing. Will Smith laugh at the joke. Yeah, he yeah, was like well, with it, and then the the the, the brain kicked in. I can say I think when he realized that she wasn't laughing, then he realized he fucked up. <laughs> and also, like, remember the whole there for the past couple of years, there's been their marriage on the forefront. She had the affair with her son's friend openly at their home. There's been a lot, and women spoke about it on her show. So uh, there's a lot of emasculating that's been going on, and it's sort of been kind of attacking. Okay. Uh, Today, March 28th, my list of people I'm talking to today is Brooke. Oh, I should write this down. Thank you. Did it work? No, I don't have video for some reason. I just have audio. Weird. Um, okay, so like I said, Brooklyn's here. Morning, Brooklyn. Um, Next, I've got Israel. Israel's right in front of me. Sebastian's not in. Robert's not in. Not yet. Amanda's here. Who else? Uh, Case, not in. And last, Will. You're on my list, Will, as well. So that's today is March 28th. Okay, let me get to lecture. So in the Zoom class, I'll put the share screen. Share screen's right here. Morning, Hamish. You haven't missed much. We're just talking about the Oscars last night. <laughs> I haven't started class yet. Um, share screen. Share screen. I'd like to share. Why is PowerPoint not showing up on here? Oh dear, whiteboard. Maybe I can share desktop. Okay, so Hamish and Elliot, you should be able to see my screen. Okay, they do. Okay, today's lecture is lecture 10, applications of microbiology to industry, that sort of thing. My first picture here is uh, 
what got me into microbiology. You see, there's a book, Streptomyces in Nature and Medicine by David Hopwood. This is a person who researches antibiotics and this bacteria called Streptomyces. Streptomyces is a microbe that makes really pretty blue pigment. And they found that a lot of Streptomyces are important for antibiotic development. And my wife did her uh, research on that bacteria. Thanks, Natalie. Oh, June. Thanks, June. Get the door. Um, other things I'm interested in is lactic acid bacteria, as well as acetic acid bacteria. Um, these are both important bacteria in food science because in lactic acid bacteria, you've got all of your fermented foods, including milk, milk products, kefir, uh, acetic acid bacteria, including vinegars of all sorts. So it's a big field for study. Okay, last week, I, when I, we were talking, we were talking about um, growth of bacteria and environmental factors for growth. And I talked about this graph that shows the lag phase, exponential phase, stationary phase, and death phase for bacteria. And I talked about how that's a lovely picture, but in reality, the um, numbers are not quite as pretty as that. They, they do look kind of messier than that. And uh, here, here's a couple of review questions for you guys. Let's start off. Uh, what temperature would you expect to find the following organisms? And remember, there's three different kinds of organisms that I gave you uh, definitions for. There's a mesophile, thermophile, and psychrophile. Will, Brooklyn, yeah, Brooklyn, go ahead. Um, the temperature range, sorry? Yeah, the temperature um, range for these three. Um, Great. So your psychrophiles could survive and grow well in the fridge. Mesophiles would uh, be found in us, and your thermophiles would be found in your compost heap. So because uh, what happens in the compost heap is things warm up, you get these organisms breaking things down. What are the four stages on, Will, your question, <laughs> what are the four stages of growth? Oh, Israel too. I guess the other one of you two. And Amanda. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those are the four phases. Um, and Amanda or Israel, one of you two, describe obligate aerobe, facultative anaerobe, microaerophile, obligate aerophile. Okay, obligate aerobes require oxygen. Obligate anaerobes cannot have oxygen. Good. Facultative anaerobes can go in either direction and microaerophiles utilize a little bit of oxygen. Great, yeah, excellent. Cool. That's good. <laughs> yeah. uh, so Israel, your question. Uh, what's the difference between an acidophile and an alkalophile? And it's in the first part of the name and the last part of the name. So file meaning it likes it. Yeah. And so. So one likes the acidic environment. Good. Right, and the alkaline being the basic, like pH, high pH, as opposed to low pH. Right, okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, today I've got a little bit of industrial kind of organism talk about what kind of organisms are out there. And what kind of industries are out there for 
fermentation. I'll talk a little bit about chocolate, kefir, coffee, tea, and cheese. Then I'll talk a little bit about industri other industrial uses of uh, microbes. I touch a little bit about genetic engineering. And at the end of lecture, I talk about two people, Alexander Fleming and Selman Waxman. They're two researchers that gave us the penicillin and antibiotic industry. Fleming, what's that? Not from <laughs> there might have been a Fleming, but uh, Fleming is in Peterborough. Well, that's so Hey, Natalie, question? Um, have you heard about the one of the, the latest antibiotic that's on the market that was discovered in soil in Spain, I believe? I haven't heard about this latest antibiotic discovered in Maine. What about it? Oh, I just wondered whether you know anything about it. Oh. I mean, I've heard about, well, it, it was, oh, that was basically what I heard was back forth that the latest antibiotic was discovered in soil, but I never really heard much about it. Um, is it, has it passed through clinical trials? I believe it's like coming to market soon. Coming to market because yeah. antibiotics coming to market are kind of rare at the moment. Yeah. Very yeah. rare. Yeah. And the reason is because there's so much, um, drug, multi-drug resistance to mm -hmm. antibiotics. Yeah. And we'll talk about multi-drug resistance next week. Um, I haven't heard of this one. I, but I know there's real active research trying to figure out this problem. Uh, one of the big names in antibiotic research in Canada is Jerry Wright from Hamilton. He's a researcher who does lots of antibiotic stuff. Um, what, what can I tell you about him? Uh, that they've recognized that there's a problem and they're trying to figure out ways around the problem, including uh, uh, doing symbiotic things where they add two antibiotics together at the same time to try and defeat the multi-drug resistance, yeah. Okay, so food industry. Uh, I have YouTube videos for us. So some of these will be, um, me just talking through the bacteria and the food for a little bit and then showing you a video. We'll see a couple of videos. So the first thing I've got here is in the food industry, we've got in dairy products, you got lactic acid bacteria like lactobacillus or lactococcus. So there's two milk bacteria, one that form the rods and the other that form the coccus. And they're formed in... Uh, Dairy products found in dairy products like cheese, butter, cultured butter, that is, sour cream, buttermilk, yogurt, kefir. There's also pickling microbes. Um, there, there's two processes of pickling, one that's kind of like a natural fermentation and the other where it's strict, just like a, you add the vinegar. Um, I brought pickles last week <laughs> and uh, uh, Hoping you guys like them. I don't know. Some people may, may it might have been. Anyway, uh, those are not fermented. Those are just strictly you add salt, vinegar, spices, cook them. Pardon? Salt oh, says fresh pack. Fresh pack, yeah. Um, there, there's also techniques where you take your cucumbers, you set them into a brine solution, and you set it onto your counter and you allow them to ferment for a week or so. And those are fermented. Yeah. Fresh packed. Right. What did you talk to you Just a fresh brine. Brine and spices and so, hot water bath. Yeah. You can make pickles once you make the salad dressing. Yeah, right. Kosher pickles, yeah, right. Kosher pickles are fermented pickles. Yeah. Yeah. Think of which um, there's other bacterial fermentations. If you're 
not aware, tea, coffee, chocolate, sausages, soy sauce, uh, they all are fermented in some form. Okay, so cocoa beans undergo fermentation. And I have here two YouTube videos. I'll show you one and we'll go back if you want to see the other one. Um, I'll leave that up to you at another time. So just ask here. Eleftheria Tere. Covered gram negative bacteria. Covered cancer patient. It's known to have some antibiotic named the Ixobactin. Ixobactin. Allow gram negative bacteria making antibiotics are kind of rare. They're usually they're from gram positive organisms. Good. Typically different. Okay, so here I have making a My chocolate bar. Chocolate bar entirely from scratch. I've traveled to the southernmost point of Mexico. Are Bless you. Open your Previously, I learned the process of carrying for and harvesting from cacao trees. After harvesting, I took a try from the rock cow straight from the tree and discovered that it had more of a surprisingly sweet fruity taste than the chocolate bowl that I was expecting. Oh, no. It's like a bitter chocolate, but it also tastes like a fruit. In order to capture the chocolate, you continue with the next step of turning it into a chocolate. You went to Rubio, who showed me the process of making the beans. Once removed from the pod, the raw beans are placed into a container. Over the next few days, a combination of microorganisms grow and begin the fermentation process. These turn the cacao sugars into alcohol, and other bacteria produce lactic acid and acidic acid. Together, these all help produce a distinct chocolate flavor in the cacao beans. During the process, the container can reach temperatures as high as 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Knowing just how long to ferment the beans is a careful science, the Rubio helps explain it. Para tener un buen chocolate, tenemos que hacer un buen fermento y una buena selección de semillas. Si usted ve aquí en mi mano, todas las semillas están precisamente Very similar to coffee. What we do with coffee as well. Después de los cuatro días de fermento, agarramos el precisamente el cacao que está ya listo, que está hidratado, y lo aventamos a la cancha a secarse. Lleva cuatro días de sol, así como está ahorita bien eliminado, son cuatro días. Si hay nubes y está muy uh, opaco, tiene que llevar cinco. Turning the beans so they would dry evenly. 
It seems to be done regularly, every hour and a half to two hours, for at least four days for the front of them. You see their two pigs that don't fit between the parents. <laughs> So this is a small scale chocolate. <laughs> Probably. Um, but really kind of a, uh, how you say, it's textured. It's the beans. It's not the smooth stuff from Hershey's. Sterilize the beans. It improves their flavor. We then spent the next 15 minutes peeling the shells from the beans in order to make a few mini bars. I'm taking that gold to make my candy bar. So, Rubio here is going to show me the traditional method they use to make the next candy bar. Yo te lo doy para que tú lo eches al molino y ya le des vuelta para que salga bien. Ya con el grano que tiene aquí el compañero y ya esto se mueve. La primera pasada y luego viene la segunda y ya en la recién. Secrets. <laughs> And you can buy these in some stores, like in Mexican stores, you see the circular chocolates. They're kind of grainy. After harvesting, fermenting, and roasting the cacao, I find the different chocolates. Yeah. She brings that to the all the time. This is Rubio, Juan Luisa, and now I'm my first look at the process of making chocolate. All right, so maybe from a Caribbean store you can get them as well. You could probably get this from a Caribbean store, the unprocessed chocolate. I asked uh, Elliot and Hamish if they could see the YouTube video. I've got no response yet, but hopefully you got to see that. Okay, so back to the PowerPoint. That's the chocolate video. Was that was Peru? Uh, where was that? I'm not too sure which one that was. I probably Mexico. And there's another one on Peru if you want to see that. And if you go to YouTube, you can see lots of different ones. Oh, the guys, like he said, in the very southern part, there's a. Oh, yeah, that's right. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> yeah. Right at the bottom of Mexico. It's usually like Peruvian like chocolate or Colombia. Or... Yeah. yeah. And the, uh, the way chocolate is manufactured, there's so many different places, so many different <clears throat> ways of doing it that you don't have a set method, set bunch of organisms. So great big corporations like Nestle want to kind of standardize the way they make the chocolate, but it's farmer mix. Me, oh no! <laughs> it sounds like a cool thing, though. Yeah, we're making it for next semester. Oh, really? Wow! So we're making sure we're making the beans. Wait, wait, 
Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. You guys are going to make chocolate. Are we going to ferment sure. or are we just doing it? A, a They're easy? already fermented. So it's finished roasted beans. Is lactic acid in Oh, we're not actually fermenting the beans ourselves. We're coming for tying purposes. Okay, so I have here fermentation is a part of the step of processing the cocos, cocoa beans. Um, they're from a cocoa tree. You have two methods. One, where you take cocoa pulp, you put it into a big heap, and you can uh, put it into banana leaves on the ground, and you squeeze that to kind of ferment it, or put it into a box and tighten it up and get it fermented as well. There's a couple of different ways of fermenting, um, and it's like a community of microbes. I have here, here's a bunch of names. Uh, so it can be bacteria and yeast and whatever's on the beans. So you have Lactobacillus fermentum, Acetobacter pastoranus, like yeast, like Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And, and here's another one, Pichia Kudzuevi. <laughs> wow. Wow, just quite the name. Anyway, so the organisms you would find can be like really plentiful, but there is this uh, yeast, lactic acid bacteria sort of mix to them. And here's two processes. What you, what you do is, first of all, you process it at the farm and send it to the factory. Uh, just uh, so on the farm, you have the cocoa tree harvesting it. Uh, then after you pick the beans, you pull out the pulp and the mass, and then you ferment it into your boxes. And then there's that drying process that they did on the pavement. That's your fermented dried cocoa beans. And then you send it to the factory and the factory, they clean them, roast them, and then they grind them up into chocolate bars, right? Raw product goes to the chocolate bars. Okay, so my next uh, food item is kefir. And kefir uh, grains are used to make fermented milk. If you go into the dairy aisle, you'll see fermented milk, by ke which is kefir. But there's kefir that's uh, not using milk, using other juices or fruit products. And that's uh, the one that I've got here for you. So here's the video for kefir. Oh, uh, that's another cacao kefir. One of the big reasons that we got into this is that the soda industry has gone such the wrong direction in my opinion. So we went ahead and say, we're gonna do the exact opposite of that. And so the original sodas were the opposite of that. Now, unfortunately in America, they went to a uh, centralized production facility model. And so that has really ruined what I consider sodas were back in the 1700s, 1800s. Before <laughs> we created techniques to fake it, we had to actually make it. This is a very special piece of gear for us. This is where we do a lot of our culture drawing. Half the operation about Waterkeeper Brewing is actually the growing and cultivating and continuing of our culture. There are tens of pounds of keeper culture inside this container. Inside of here, what you see is wonderful bags of secondary food. Now, we feed them a wonderful diet of apricots, and figs, and other fruits in their dry state. And those are fed to them on a continuous basis. That's part of it. That's just you know what you can see. <laughs> so I'm going to get some of the culture out so you can actually see. You can see some of them floating on the surface. Water keeper culture being grown. They're all at a small size right now. They're in the rookery. They're in the process of growing to the right size and right consistency to make it into the beverages to ferment them into their perfection. What is that? Water keeper is a natural product that grows in every mountain spring above seven thousand feet, or at least it used to. And different cultures, and back in the day, everyone brought their animals up to the spring to drink, to eat. They would have an interaction with the spring, 
throw their food, let their animals drink and lactate all over it. And then they come back the next moon cycle and voila, the water keeper is growing. So someone figured out that this would make something. Well, the, the shepherds who did this, of course, had their animals. And on the way back, they would collect up the milk from their sheep and their goats, and they would put the crystals in there because they're a long term tradition of doing so. And that became the milk keeper, the tradition of milk keeper. And that tradition has two branches. The people who came off the mountain with keeper, some of them put it in their milk. Some of them used it to digest their herbs and their berries and their other things, their honey and other things. And there became the origin of most of the fermented beverages that we drink today. Now we believe, and this is my opinion, that keeper was the origin of a lot of those. We found it in the old Hat Ales recipes. We found it in ancient alchemist texts. We found it all over in Egyptian texts and Mayan texts. And I've been to all these places and they still drink these out. Almost all indigenous societies have these sort of beverages at the core because they are about survival and about taking the most nutrients away from their body. And so, water keepers become one of the top fermenting processes and techniques because it has been used for centuries effectively. It's got the longest running safety record of anything I can think of. First, there was wild fermentation, then there was focused fermentation. So, what people could collect from nature became the original thing that they used. So that's back around again today, and because we're all suffering from oversugaring, and as this research has come up to show just how important the relationship is between the probiotics and human health and wellness, these guys become more and more important. See these little crystals in here? These little crystals are actually the conversion of sucrose to crystalline dextrose. So this is a it's called a SCOBY, a symbiotic culture of microorganisms. The SCOBY. Here, a couple of different microbes. It's much different than the scoby from capsule. It's like a giant kombucha. crystal capsule that all of the microorganisms live inside of and creates really wonderful compounds in nature. This is our hibiscus. <clears throat> Whatever the color of the beverage is, it flavors and colors the keeper crystals. They take it on. They're hibiscus flowers. Yeah, very pretty. And special elements that are in this liquid. And creating the enzymes and the um, nutrition. You go to the Caribbean and store and you buy the flowers. Infused in here. Every enlightened beverage that we produce goes through three fermentations. We also make a wonderful coffee product. Now, people are like, what? Well, what we found is the some of the original methods of producing Instead coffee. Instead of flower juice. Traditionally made <laughs> Tasty five, flower juice. Years ago was to ferment the coffee. Cooking the coffins came a little later, and the ancient tradition of coffee fermentation is what we're really into here. And so, what we set about to do okay. is to take everything so, that we consider wrong with coffee or unhealthy about coffee. He's talking about kefir. So, if you want to watch the rest of the video, it's there. Uh, let's carry on. Right. So, different kinds of fruits and kefir. And the kefir is just fermenting the product, the raw stuff that he's got. So are, they, are these alcoholic beverages he's making? Well, there's a byproduct of lactic acid and uh, alcohol, but it's not as much. Yeah. Uh, so I've got two slides here for fermenting kefir. So you've got the grains, and the grains are, like he said, a combo of bacteria and yeasts. And the little grains kind of look like cauliflower grains, and they can be really tiny or fairly large. And it can be a mix of lactic acid bacteria. And I've got here lactobacillus, lactococcus, leuconostoc. And you remember leuconostoc is the one that comes out of uh, sauerkraut. So very similar to food bacteria. And then there's your yeasts. Uh, yeast called Cleveromyces, Candida, Saccharomyces, Pitchia, and acetic acid bacteria like Acetobacter as well. And I've got like a list, just a long list of common lactobacillus and a list of yeast as well, if you want to take a look. Oops. Um, and just another slide saying the kind of the same thing. Bacteria genera found uh, include lactobacillus, lactococcus, streptococcus, leuconostoc. And what happens when the uh, population grows? 
is the change from being um, I have I thought I wrote it down. There, there is a population shift proportion. So it may start off as um, Leuconostock and then change to the Streptococcus or Bacillus. And it changes by, <laughs> it's just kind of a random change based on um, the kind of thing you feed it and the place it's found. Okay, so next uh, group of foods, coffee. So coffee is also treated the same way as cocoa. Uh, with coffee, you're fermenting that as well. And I've got a couple of videos here, one from Ethiopia, another from Central America, and another from Kenya. Uh, I had made these slides yesterday and I changed them. So uh, and one of the reasons I changed it is this Ethiopian one was on there twice. But just to show you a short coffee making video. So I'm just going to say in the chat, did you see the video? Oh, they saw it. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Hamish. Okay, so next video is this one on, that's fine, uh, coffee. What is my name? And my my name is my name is Musungu. Just a short two minute video on this. So they're picking the seeds, pulping the seeds. Great. Then ferment. The coffee bear, yeah. This is a bigger setup than the chocolate setup. And look at that, it's just fields of coffee beans drying in the sun. Just wait. <laughs> Mama. So that's that one. Uh, here's another one, Ethiopian. What do I have here? El Salvador. This one's 22 minutes long, so we won't watch all of it. <laughs> I'm El Salvador. I had this incredible opportunity to come down here and work on a coffee farm for a week. 
And after talking to the farm manager, Louise, it sounds like it's going to be a busy week. First, we're going to go up to the mountains where the coffee's grown. Can you imagine carrying a 100 pound bag down here? You'll learn how they pick the beans. And then we're going to bring the beans back down here where they wash, dry, and bag the beans. My wife, Kelly, and I traveled from our farm in Oregon down to El Salvador, which is a country known for delicious pupusas and some of the highest quality coffee beans in the world. The goal of this trip was to learn how coffee is grown and harvested to see what farming is like in this region of the world. We set to spend the week at El Cinque de Cristiani Percar, located near the quiet town of Guadalupe, which only has one church and two schools, and revolves mostly around agriculture, like sugarcane and coffee beans. The farm is owned by Luis Cristiani and operated by Luis Gutierrez. His son, Luis Jr., acted as our translator during our visit. Our day starts traveling up the steep and rough slopes of Cinque de Pec, the second highest volcano in El Salvador. That's a volcano right there. It was a slow and bumpy hour-long drive of our <laughs> to our first stop. I think Oops. we should explore a few solutions. Grab any suggestions. Can you tell the difference by looking at them? Like, would Louise recognize them? Can you say, it's a corporation? After climbing just a little ways, I'm struck by how different this farming is from what I do back home. <laughs> you don't see fields of coffee plants here, like we would have fields of, say, green beans or corn back home. Here, the farms blend into the hillside, and they're intermixed with the thick jungle vegetation. Plants in the shade, they just look a lot thicker too. So you really want to have just everything covered if you can. You can leave all the trees to grow naturally to provide shade. Okay, I'll just pause it right there, move it ahead a bit to see if we can't see the fermenting process. So they pick it. Um, this video is not so good for the process of fermenting. Okay, so, but that's kind of the process. You pick it, ferment it, dry it, grind it, send it to uh, Starbucks. <laughs> Okay. Next one, next video or next uh, bit of information. So in coffee, you've got a lot of different organisms, uh, including enterobacteria, lactic acid bacteria. Again, so this lactic acid bacteria is common in foods. There's also yeasts, acetic acid bacteria, again, common in foods. And anything on the coffee bean including bacilli, fungus, um, during fermentation, it says here from one of my sources, oops, I, I put in the Dr. Views tin, anyway. So Lucana stalks, uh, which is found in fermenting of cabbage and sauerkraut, they, they start off the fermentation and then lactobacilli take over. And then you get a lactic acid fermentation. Okay, so similar to the last fermenting we saw. Tea, tea is the same thing. Uh, when I say same thing, what they do is they ferment your leaves and they sell the fermented leaves. That's a video of tea fermentation. Green tea, I guess, is not fermented, is it? I don't think, but uh, black tea is. The journey and the process behind the cup of tea is a long one. 
and it begins much before you begin to steep your favorite cuppa. Growing tea and processing it is an art demanding much care and detail. Tea bushes are planted during monsoons. Regular application of folium, which is a mixture of chemicals such as zinc and magnesium, provide for the health of these bushes. Tea leaves, or the produce, are plucked almost throughout the year. Produce is particularly high post-monsoons due to a spurt in growth. Hand plucking is a traditional method involving hundreds of women plucking tea leaves with their hands. Each of these women will contribute up to 21 kilograms of plucked tea leaves at the end of their working day. Hand plucking is today being supplemented by hand sharing. This method has been introduced to counter the effects of large-scale migration by labor communities to the big cities. It's based around uh, 66 animal brands, uh, shelf shopping blade, carbon tip blade. So it, it's uh, due much faster cutting mm -hmm. to the weight. Yeah. The plucked tea leaves are transported to the nearest factory. This particular factory I am visiting belongs to the Balanor Plantations and Industries Limited. This building is around 135 years old, but is replete with modern machinery. I take a stroll and get a closer look at how tea is processed here. The general manager at Balanor, Jeevan Deliapa, is a friendly gentleman showing me around. He explains how the processing begins with wooden. Whether it's a process where you remove only the surface moisture, the moisture is say about 80%, it will be remain at 65 percent and only 15% is removed. Okay. But that, is, that takes almost about 15 hours. So when you roll it, and it's processed in the form. Okay. Uh -huh. There is no moisture that comes no out. Moisture. So it releases slowly. Withering increases caffeine content in the leaves. These leaves are then sifted and shredded. The shredded leaves still seem fresh and moist. They fill up the air with a heavy scent of cut green leaves. The humidity level inside the factory is rather high as this aids the processing. Now we have five cuts of five bags of CDC cut with crushed hair and curl. Yes, yes. You can just see the roller here. So that's where crushing, tearing, and curling takes place. After crushing, tearing, and curling, it gets into the fermentation area. This fermentation depends on the temperature and the weather conditions. If the weather conditions rainy, we need more time for in summer, we need faster time for fermentation. Fermentation is nothing but oxidization. Enzymatic oxidization activates antioxidant polyphenols, which are known to be responsible for the color, flavor, and benefits popularly associated with tea. Once it's fermented already, the color changes so much. Oh, yeah, it's already gone. Infusion, I told you, when you when you taste your tea, your color of the infusion is very important. You have to have coppery brown. So if it is under fermented, you don't get a good tea. If it is low fermented, you don't get good tea. So you have to balance it. Now we do both. Brown fermentation as well as slow fermentation. Brown fermentation half an hour, then slow fermentation for an hour. Then it fell into the dryer. Now once it goes into the dryer, it's fired at a very high temperature of uh, 130 degrees centigrade. Okay. By the time it the, uh, from the uh, dryer discharge it comes out, the moisture will be only 2%. Ah, okay. 55% of moisture taken out. Within 18 minutes. The output of the dryer is into super fine dust, super red dust, red dust, and petrol dust. 
and good grades are between the top of the tackle families, broken tackle, tackle, and scrubbing tackle. Each of these brings a slightly varied strength and flavor to the final cup of tea you and I enjoy. In the final phase of tea processing, each grade is winnowed to allow only the denser particles to be taken into the packaged produce. The lighter particles are used to recondition non premium tea in future processing cycles. Okay, so <laughs> uh, they kind of went over the fermenting really fast, but it was a very short process in the processing of the tea. So what do you guys think? Makes you want tea? <laughs> or coffee? It's coffee. I'll stick with coffee. <laughs> okay, and a uh, final in industrial fermentation, I'm talking about is cheese. So with cheese, there's lots of different um, organisms used. I just pulled this off of the internet uh, just this morning. I was just, I wanted to share a couple of things with you. So I've got their <clears throat> blue mold, as well as white mold. With the blue mold, you have organisms like Penicillium roquefortii, Penicillium uh, glacum. So that makes your blue mold. That would be the Stilton's, uh, Camonzola, those kinds of cheeses. And then there's your white mold, Penicillium camber, camemberti. So the camembert cheese, the brie cheese. You have organisms applied to the surface. And uh, when the mold grows, it has a crust of hyphae. So the crust on the outside is the mold that's growing on the outside of the cheese. And the cheeses are secreting enzymes, making it soft on the inside. Then there's Munster and Limburger cheese made by Brevi bacterium linus. Um, this bacteria has a fairly strong odor, <laughs> as you probably, has anybody tried Limburger cheese? Yeah, huh? so <clears throat> aromatic. Yeah, a very strong cheese. And then uh, it needs a salty, moist environment and the cheese makers continually wash the surface of the cheese with the wash solution. And you get a red cheese at the end because it got a smeary red outside for, from the organisms. Then there's your eye forming cheese. Uh, so if you have Gouda or Swiss cheese, they have this bacteria, Propionobacterium roid Ricci, and they convert lactic acid into carbon dioxide, propionic acid. And what that does is when it's fermenting, it uh, expands the gas, making your, your bubbles inside of the cheese. So your Swiss cheese is bubbling bacteria, <laughs> making the little holes in your uh, Swiss cheese. Um, it says it converts citric acid to give a cheese a buttery flavor. And the cheese is soft. As the bacteria grows, the gases make little round openings. Um, that's the cheese. And here's a cheese making demo. The high point of cheese making is breaking it up and taking it out. This needs care. The heart is always drawn through the cheese mass following the same path. This is the only way to ensure that the cream cheese is always reduced to the same size crumbs, so that the quality of the cheese remains constant. Fifty liters of milk yield a cheese wheel weighing about five kilos. At the beginning of the out season, Andreas Eaton produces 24 cheeses daily. Toward the end, 
just 12 every two days. But the time saved is relative. The working steps are the same whether the quantity of milk is small or large, and the work in the cheese cellar increases with each cheese produced. The dairyman always used to put the corners of the cheesecloth in his mouth, and this age-old tradition is still kept up today. But the hydraulic lift makes taking it out much easier. <laughs> Now we know. At last, it's time. The cream cheese is taken out of the copper vat. The whey is left behind. In former times, workers on the Alps might have taken a bath in it, but now that's frowned upon for reasons of hygiene. <laughs> the whey forms an excellent basis for good food. The meat of alpine pigs is considered especially nutritious and is in great demand because alpine pigs are fed a healthy diet. On the Kalfaisen Alp, the farmers who own the pigs pay a lump sum as the dairy cows or young cattle. And Andreas Eaton, who owns three of them, is no exception. The pigs feast on the way with relish, but for them too, this delicacy starts to run out towards the end of the season. Andreas Eaton is a qualified forester and has completed an agricultural apprenticeship. Later, he would like to take over a farm. Although this is the second time he's been in charge of cheese production in the Kalfaisen Alp, at just under 25, he's very young for this responsible job. That's a lot Timing of cheese. is extremely important for the quality of the cheese. The sequence of the individual production steps is always the same. In order to maintain the same temperature, humidity, pressure, and so on, each and every day. Only cheese which is actually produced on an Alp can be sold as Alpine cheese. And that means handmade out of raw milk from cows that can move freely and feed on Alpine pastures. The Kalfaisener Alpine cheese meets all these criteria. Oh, sorry. Cleanliness is an important prerequisite for producing good cheese. The cleaning of milking equipment, buckets and vats, is one of Anina Bloom's jobs. The cheese cellar is mainly looked after by Peter Kaufman. The 68-year-old has found a new passion after retirement. And this is his eighth season as an assistant dairyman. Previously, he had worked for the post office for 40 years. While the volume of milk and cheese production decrease over the summer, the number of cheeses in the cheese cellar grows constantly, and they need to be bought out every day, greased, and put away again. A job that requires plenty of energy. <laughs> the production of our fine butter is another task of the dairyman and his assistant. Every day. The cream is yeah. pasteurized and acidified before it is poured into the butter churn so that the butter doesn't go rancid. Getting the deep yellow lumps out of the drum can make the heart of even a hardened herdsman beat faster. But then kneading it under cold running water until the last remaining buttermilk is pressed out literally needs a cold-blooded approach because you can't do it with warm hands. The slabs of butter up here are different to those in the shopping center. They weigh a kilo, and it takes some skill to prize them out of their time on a wooden mold.
Towards the end of July, the cheese cellar is full. The moment has come to taste the young Alpine cheese together with the Altmaster and to transport the first 130 cheeses into the valley. A reason to celebrate, especially when the cheese is good. <laughs> Each farmer participating is entitled to an amount of cheese corresponding to his cow's milk production. But even the smallest celebration has its price. The additional work over lunch means that the Alpine workers have to give up their usual lunchtime nap. <laughs> oh, so hard. <laughs> In the small Alsatian village of Yirfelet, half an hour away from Basel, Bena Antoni runs a very special cheese company. He is considered a cheese expert par excellence, supplying royalty and plant hotels all over the world. He also attracts private cheese enthusiasts. He readily confirms that cheese from freely grazing cows, goats, and sheep tastes better than what you get from one fed in a barn. It's like night and day. That's why I only buy my hard cheese between spring and autumn. Everything which is Tom cheese, I buy only during the period when the cattle graze outside. Lena Anthony calls his profession Eleveur de Fromage. He buys his cheese from producers and then keeps up to 150 varieties in his cellars until they have fully ripened. Anthony grew up in humble circumstances and received no professional training. He eventually found work as a market store holder. A friend advised him to peddle cheese alongside the socks, bras, and chocolate. This proved to be a stroke of luck because it's how he met the famous food critic Wolfram Siebeck. Cheese looks good. Meantime, if you like cheese, not everybody likes cheese. <laughs> While his son, Robert Anthony, takes care of orders received, the maitre fromager himself advises his customers in his store, as well as all over the world. So, uh, several different kinds of cheeses, several different kinds of results, different kinds of bacteria into different fermenting. Okay, so two questions. Uh, can you name me a food industry that uses a specified microbe for their products? Yes. Yeah, all the things we just saw. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, name a food industry that does not use a specific microbe. Cocoa, tea, chocolate. It's just whatever's there. Thanks. Okay, and that's the food industry questions or points. Next, I'm gonna talk about uh, microbes for industrial biotech, antibiotics, vaccines, insecticides. So let's talk a little bit about antibiotics. Just a brief point about antibiotics. Most antibiotics are made by bacteria that come from the soil. Uh, streptomyces are a large, group name that is responsible for tetracycline, erythromycin, streptomycin. Um, I'm trying to come up with another name, but there's, there's plenty. There, if you've used polysporin, um, polysporin is a product that has a triple antibiotic formula and the triple antibiotic formula comes from three forms of bacillus. Bacillus subtilis makes bacitracin. Bacillus brevis makes 
Grandma Sidon and Bacillus polymyxa makes polymyxin. So there's your three antibiotics from different Bacillus bacteria in your polysporin. Okay. Yeah. So then, I mean, if you're looking at most antibiotics are made by bacteria that live in the soil, and you look at just how, as parents, maybe we've gone like over the top when it comes to cleanliness and sanitizing and really being uber careful. I was not that mother. But <laughs> I'm saying, you know, even the overuse of antibiotics, like every time your kid is sick, they're on an antibiotic instead of allowing them to develop an immune system. And then we take something like polysporin that is literally made from bacteria that's found in the same soil that we're trying to keep the kids from. Now we're trying to give them back the same bacteria. It's just sort of dumb. It, yeah, it, it, well, don't touch it, the dirty dirt bacteria because you're going to get the germ. But oh, look, now you've got a germ. Here's this medicine made from the germs in the soil. <laughs> <laughs> it will. It is proven that farm kids, specifically, yeah. still to this day, are healthier, are healthier because we eat a shit ton of dirt. <laughs> if I go back to like my older children, <laughs> the three boys that, that I had that were just it's compared to my daughter who's in this era, she loved hand sanitizer. <laughs> She's sickly all the time. Yeah. The boys, you know. Well, oh, will had a point. Oh, yeah. Uh, polysporin. How the hell does that work? It's just a surface, right? Like, how? Barrier. Um, he doesn't, he doesn't, like, bad bacteria. It's a barrier. It's just something. Well, it, 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 and it I also mean, kills, like, I mean. Yeah, if you're putting it on cups and stuff, is it yeah. like, is it, is it like antimicrobial or something? It's, it, it's like a disinfectant antimicrobial, but sterile and to so kill off the bacteria that are there. So uh, you have tons of bacteria all over you right now that are beneficial. So if you have a cut, there may be the occasional one that's not beneficial. So if you put your polysporin there, it'll hopefully knock it out. It's the toxins produced from those bacteria. That or, or even the infectious agents. Some of them are actually infectious. Uh, so some of them have toxins, some of them have infect, or have become infections. So if it becomes in, like uh, the colony that's growing there, you may have a hard time getting rid of it. It'll. But I'm saying like back in Tracin, Gramicidin, and Polymyxin are the antibiotics. They're the toxins that those bacteria produce, right? Yeah. The so compound. The, 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 so those compounds are the toxic to this. Makes us sick. Right. Everything that bacteria, so maybe not a toxin. Everything that bacteria produces might not be a toxin. Right. Because if you think about it, yeast is what produces alcohol and it's not toxin. I was going to say alcohol. Yeah, you can drink enough of it. What would you call the nomenclature for vasotracin? Antibiotics. It's antibiotics. Those are antibiotics, yeah, uh, because they are compounds known to uh, kill bacteria. Right. So that bacteria produces an antibiotic, or would it be yes? What's the by the byproduct is just called an antibiotic? Yes. Okay. In the states, but there's so, a product so that, that is like so that that is, that's sold, and it's called that's in bacteria. Does does not kill that bacteria. Vaccine falling. Right. Uh, you can so, so if you are trying to prevent that bacteria from infecting you, you can't use that. Like you have a bacteria producing an, an antibiotic. Um, the that antibiotic cannot kill the bacteria, isn't it? The antibiotic doesn't kill that bacteria, but it kills other bacteria. Yes. So it's like a a war. With specialized instruments, so it'll, it won't kill itself, but it'll kill others. Yeah. So, so it, nobody gets an infection of Bacillus subtilis, but they do get a staph staph infection. Right. Um, we don't go into that, do we? No. <laughs> uh, but we do talk. I, I will talk about. Streptomycin, 
Um, then there's uh, vaccines. It's another really important area of research. I have a really disgusting picture here on the right hand side. Uh, here's a woman who's been infected with smallpox. And they think that a lot of our paintings from the Renaissance medieval times of royalty, uh, what you could do is you hire a painter who will paint the person in portrait and uh, avoid the smallpox scars. So you get a, an idealized image of what our uh, um, royalty from back then looked like. But because smallpox was such a prevalent sort of disease back in the medieval time, uh, Renaissance time, all the way to the 1800s, um, and industry does a large vaccine production. How is this found? Um, well, we, we have this history of cowpox and uh, smallpox vaccines. What, what they were um, observed was that with cowpox, a lot of milkmaids didn't suffer from these cowpox uh, viral attacks. So what they would do is they would be around cows and that exposure to the cows prevented them from getting cowpox. Whereas other people would get sick from cowpox. Mm -hmm. So they, they were like, uh, they had immunity based on their exposure to it. And there was another story. Um, if you want to read from the Guardian, I've got the link down here of this woman. Her name is Lady Mary Wortley Montague. So she went onto a vacation into uh, Turkey and she was at the spas in Turkey and she noticed something absolutely bizarre. And that was a lot of the people who were attending the uh, Turkish baths, they didn't have smallpox scars. Everybody was clean. And she was like, oh my goodness, like what is going on? Like, why are all these people without smallpox scars? Like, how does this happen? And she kind of dug into it and found that there's this uh, um, technique. What women would do is they would find a person who had smallpox and transfer that infection to another person. But it had to be a certain type of smallpox infection. And that prevented the next person from getting the disease. It's kind of like your uh, chicken, pox party. chicken pox party. <laughs> yeah, where you'd find one kid with chicken pox, they, everybody goes to have a party there. It's a bad idea, I know. But uh, um, so smallpox was kind of her thought that this is something that doctors could do. And uh, treat people in England. She came back to England, shared her ideas, and the doctor said, well, you're a woman. Um, this is part of the uh, history of the vaccination thing. Uh, you, you wouldn't know very much about medicine. Leave it to us doctors. And uh, it took them quite a while to figure it out. She was discredited, but uh, we, we do have um, vaccines based on kind of like her initial work. Uh, what was I going to say about this? The, the word vaccine, uh, Latin vaca is cow. So it comes from this research on cow diseases. <laughs> um, so we have here the SARS COVID 2. Vaccine as well. I posted a little picture here. There's different kind of ways of making vaccines. You can fit. There's your RNA vaccine as well as your viral vac vaccine. Uh, with the viral vector, what you do is you put a bit of the spike protein into a molecule that carries that into a person, or the RNA, where you have the RNA that carries the RNA into a person. Uh, there's also recombinant protein vaccines in development where they're trying to figure out a way to bring the protein into the body. So this is an active area of research as well.
And uh, there's a information for RNA vaccines if you're curious, interested in it. Vitamin C is another product that is uh, fermented and made by microbes. Um, so with vitamin C, you have vitamin C naturally in fruits and vegetables. And we require vitamin C. If you don't have enough vitamin C, you could get scurvy. Um, yeah, so people figured there is a reason for taking vitamin C. Why don't they industrially uh, produce it? And what they do is they have this process called the Richstein process, and it um, uses two steps to make vitamin C. I just put a table here of some fruits, vegetables that have various amounts of vitamin C. So something like camu camu, I've never heard of this or used it before, but apparently it's very high in vitamin C. Chili peppers, red peppers, really high in vitamin C, broccoli, all the way down to oranges and lemons, which not quite as uh, much vitamin C, but uh, it's still quite important for vitamin C content. So with your making of vitamin C, what you do is you have a uh, sugar and perform a hydrogen hydrogenation, so hydrogenation, what will, uh, that will do is remove this bond here, this case the double bond oxygen, now it's a single bond oxygen, so you've added hydrogens to it, and then you feed it to bacteria, and in this case, gluconobacter oxidans, and then with gluconobacter oxidans, they convert the, uh, what was glucose or sugar into sorbose, you add acetone, you, you purify that product, oxidize it, and you get ascorbic acid, which can go into your pills to sell over the counter at uh, uh, drug stores. Um, and then there's another one that's uh, two steps. So same thing where you have gluconobacter oxidants making your uh, sorbose, and then they add a bacillus species, and the bacillus will esterify it and make your ascorbic acid. Uh, what that's done is just simplify the process by one step. So it, it saves money, saves time if you do it that way. Okay, so in pharmaceutical industry and biotech, they have uh, ways of making enzymes, hormones, we have different diseases for heart attacks, like streptokinase, insulins used for diabetes, uh, human proteins. And it, as you can see in the picture here, they have large fermenters. And inside of the fermenters, you got your uh, fermenting bacteria making your products. Anybody here work at a vitamin factory? Or know anybody who works at a vitamin factory? No. What's that? Well, why? I've I've never talked to anybody who's worked in one, so I was just wondering. Vitamins. <laughs> Breweries are cool too. Yeah. Um, other industries for bacteria include, as yeah, everybody has been talking about this semester. Uh, we've got the botulinum toxin for making Botox. And you've also got other things for biofuels, hormones, proteins. And I've got a quote there from Pasteur, never underestimate the power of a microbe. Oh, and that's it for the uh, antibiotics and vaccines. Next we'll do bioremediation. So with bioremediation, this is a word that means you use microbes to alter the environment and remediate or uh, get rid of some contaminant or get rid of something that you don't want there. So uh, in one case, you can use bioremediation to uh, clean up an oil spill. So if you spill some oil, set down some microbes, eventually the microbes will 
degrade the oil and uh, clean up the oil spill. And this is an active area of research. They're trying to find some really strong bacteria that could do that. Um, there's also this idea of genetic, genetically modified organisms, GMOs. Uh, this is a very contentious issue. Some people don't like the idea of adding genetically modified organisms into our feedstock. Um, I eat a lot of, well, I, I say I eat a lot of, I, I do have Doritos. I like Doritos, but I, and I know that uh, Doritos chips are genetically modified um, corn, but uh, North America has different rules than Europe. Europe doesn't allow genetically modified foods whereas uh, North America has allowed it. Um, so what are genetically modified organisms? What you do is you alter the plant somehow. You alter its genetics. And by altering the genetics of the plant, you've provided some sort of resistance to disease or uh, insects. So here I have Bacillus thuringiensis. This is a bacterium, a BT bacterium. Um, you can see here, it's got this capsule shape, this endospore bacteria. It's got a crystal of what's referred to as a BT toxin. The BT toxin is uh, what's really important for this bacteria because that toxin kills insects. So it's a insecticide that this bacteria makes. And so what they've done is they've taken the gene for BT uh, toxin formation and put that into a plant. And what that does is it doesn't allow the insects to harvest on the plant. So it gives a plant resistance to the uh, insects. So you can see here, Here's my corn. These are these ones are infected by European corn borers, and if they have a diet of this bacteria, the bacteria has the BT toxin killing off the corn borers. Okay. Yeah. Well. Um, what they've done is they've introduced that gene into the plant. Uh, I know you can't see it very well here. So you have the plant, uh, the gene for the bacteria is inserted into the plant, and then the plant can actually make the toxin on its own now. And so if the plant is making the toxin, your bacteria aren't going to be able to infect the plant. Um, that's a question for scientists. <laughs> they would work with that. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I, I don't know if it is like something in the roots and the leaves. I would expect it to just be in the the flower, but um, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, um, there's also a concern with butterflies and GMO plants because uh, you've got these toxins that um, are bad for insects. And so your bees, butterflies, they land on the plants. They could be killed because they're ingesting the toxins. And this may account for why we're seeing insect declines on account of uh, our genetically modified plants. Um, which is a concern. So question one, I've got Brooklyn, oh, Brooklyn stepped out. Israel, Amanda, Will, question for you guys, which microbe may, ferments glucose making vitamin C? Do you guys remember what it was called? What's your this Gluconobacter. That's good. Oxidants, yep. Yeah. Gluconobacter, good. Uh, that's the one that, and it was uh, 
That's in the one step process and the two step process. So this uh, bacillus. Okay. Question two What components are used to manufacture a vaccine? So I, I, I gave you three. There was in the uh, Pfizer Moderna one, it's RNA. And then there's the viral vector. particles in a vector, uh, like uh, which one is that one? I'm trying to remember the name of the uh, antiviral vaccine company, Johnson & Johnson. Um, they have killed virus parts inside of their uh, vaccine. And then there's the other one that has a uh, protein. Which organisms are used to produce three antibiotics in polysporin? Will, Israel, do you guys remember? Those are your antibiotics. Yeah. Uh, do you? Polymyxin. Do you remember the, the first part of the name of the bacteria that make it? Bacillus brevis, yeah, good. Uh, Will, question for you. <laughs> Are GMO plants a concern for honeybees and monarch butterflies, and why? No. <clears throat> it's a question of whether it's a concern or not. Yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is stop right there. There's the discovery of antibiotics. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that next day with Alexander Fleming and Simon Waxman. Okay, uh, but before I go, uh, let me just scroll right through all of these. Any questions? I have a little Gary Larson slide. So until next week, Adios, amigos. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I'll try and wrap up with a course review on the 11th of April, a final test on the 18th. Uh, if you haven't checked, I did grade the tests. The tests came out, the average was a little high, but. Uh, the There's uh, both low and high on the test, some low, some high. Thanks for listening. I'm going to stop sharing. So, uh, Elliot Hamish, thanks for being part of class. Cheers. See you tomorrow, Paul. Brooklyn, can I see you for a second? I do this for the science class number four. Uh, no, he did. Do you want to do it right now? Sure. I actually needed some help with it. That's why I did it. Yeah, we're going to do it. Okay. Not long at all. Just straight.